You've perhaps noticed that we haven't talked much lately about American art, and there's a reason for this. America and Europe were following different trajectories, put quite simply. In general, European artists were being highly expressive and experimental and making all sorts of avant-garde work, while American artists were more focused on tradition, and this is seen in their artistic approaches, which were more aligned with realism and impressionism, which were two art styles that at this point had been around for some time. But then there was an event that happened that was like a sort of catalyst that helped American artists get on track when it came to making experimental avant-garde art, although we're not going to see this being fully realized until the Second World War. This event was the Armory Show, which was held in 1913. It was a huge exhibit. It had in it around 1,600 works of art that were made by both Europeans and Americans. But what was most important about this show was not that it was large in size per se, but was that it gave American artists and the wider American public exposure to European artistic developments. Now, needless to say, there was a lot of controversy surrounding the show because people were saying things that were new and unfamiliar. One piece that received particular criticism, which we're familiar with this piece, is Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase, which was referred to in American media as an explosion in a shingle factory. Now, what happens when something is controversial? Everyone wants to see what all the fuss is about. Approximately 87,000 people attended this exhibit in New York, which means that it made this avant-garde European art quite visible. Now, it's not like people saw the exhibit and now modernism is a thing in American art. Change happens slowly. Artists begin to slowly move in the direction of experimentation and art institutions, museums and galleries, they began to collect European work. Essentially, the Armory Show introduces the idea of modern art to American audiences, getting them aware of it and getting comfortable with its ideas, which paves the way for the emergence of a wholly avant-garde style that emerges in America, and that will happen, as I said, closer to the Second World War. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at two artistic trends in American art between the First and Second World Wars, before American art truly became avant-garde. The first style that we're going to start with, social realism. Now, social realism was a style that had its origins in realism, in that both styles prioritized straightforward, austere subjects articulated with meticulous brushstroke to create realistic and descriptive works of art. However, a point of distinction. Social realism was more focused on the ways in which industrialization impacted those living in an urban environment, while as we know, realism, also concerned with industrialization, tends to focus more on the rural. Now, another link between realism and social realism was that both had a somewhat political leaning with the belief that art can and should speak for the everyman and that it could be used for a catalyst to change. Edward Hopper, he was a social realist painter, super famous, and uh, he created powerful works of art that really resonated in terms of feelings of isolation and alienation. And uh, he felt these things, like many other artists, was a result of modern industrialized urban life. Now his style is pretty consistent. So uh, it's, it's fairly easy to recognize an Edward Hopper piece once you're familiar with his approach. Um, so commonly what we see are um, scenes that are eerily calm. They're too calm, too quiet. And uh, this can be quite unsettling. Now he achieves this in a couple of ways, okay? First of all, if you, and you can see it in the piece, he uses this stark treatment of light and a rather severe geometric treatment of the landscape, which again, we know geometric shapes, analytical lines that comprise those shapes, that those tend to, you know, make people feel a little uncomfortable because there's not a lot of emotional uh, expression happening there. 
Also what we see typically in a Hopper piece is uh, a minimal or de-emphasized human presence. And that's definitely the case in this piece as well. Now Hopper felt that there were many things that were wrong with the world and that it stemmed from the fact that people had left the peaceful, simple rural life and that they had come to large cities and that living in urban environments were bad, was bad for the human condition, creating lonely people who are isolated and anonymous. Now loneliness is clearly emphasized here in this very famous painting. What does Hopper include here to convey this idea of loneliness? Pause the video to spend a couple minutes with this artwork. Look closely to craft your own interpretations. Now, hopefully you did that. Uh, let's start with a formal analysis, right? So we're gonna be looking at things like line, shape, color, etc. How does Hopper use these things to set up a composition that instills this sense of loneliness? Now, there's one thing I had already mentioned and that was the geometric shape, right? You can see that you know, back in here, these squares, this kind of rectangle situation, here's some more rectangles, more squares, right? All of these geometric shapes, analytical lines, which again, tend to emotionally marginalize the viewer. What we also see is a complementary color scheme, the red set against the greens, right? Creates that sort of jarring color contrast in the eye, which can also make the viewer feel sort of on edge. Uh, how about space, right? Um, the space is like crowded, but not. It's crowded in the sense that like we are kind of trapped in this area of this city. There's no um, way to see past this building. To me, it's almost like cage-like in a way. Uh, so there, there's that crowding of the space, but then at the same time, the space uh, is, is empty. And then you've got this eerie sort of spotlight uh, that's kind of coming in, creating a diagonal line, right, which we know diagonal lines create tension. And this um, light sort of is hard, source is hard to interpret. Is this like a street light? Is this the moon? Is this the sun? Probably not the sun because it's called Nighthawks. We're not really sure what the light approach is, and that can also make us feel uncomfortable as well. We're, we're uncomfortable when we don't have a lot of information. Now let's look at the subject right? These empty streets, streetscapes that Hopper is so well known for. Look how empty it is. There's no people. There's no trash. There's no magazine kiosks. Look in the windows, right? Empty, dark, black. It seems like these storefronts are vacant and abandoned. Now, how about this diner? First of all, the act of eating is usually something that's a communal process. It's usually something that people do with other people. And something like going out to eat is certainly intended to be a social activity. Does it seem as though these people are enjoying themselves? I would say no. Even the people who are together seem alone, which in my book is the worst kind of loneliness, to be lonely in the presence of somebody else. What's worse is they don't interact with us, the viewer. I mean, this guy even has our back, his back to us, right? No one is acknowledging our presence, which makes this loneliness all the more pervasive. And if we aren't feeling shut out enough, we literally are outsiders looking in. Edward Hopper has not included an entrance here, so we could not go in and interact with these people, even if we wanted to. What else promotes loneliness? I would say probably the starkness of the interior. It's like hospital-like, it's so sterile. There's a lack of decor. It's not at all something that's very welcoming. And then again, the light is like way overly bright. Now, essentially what we're looking at is we're looking at loneliness in public spaces. Loneliness despite a cloak's proximity with somebody else. A loneliness that is directly involving the viewer all together to reflect a relative disdain for the modern urban existence. And this was pretty much the exact same thing communicated in very similar ways in what we were seeing with French Impressionist painting. Remember this painting? Remember Degas' absinthe drinkers? It's the same message really, simply articulated through a different stylistic language. Now, photography. Photography was an especially effective vehicle to communicate the tenets of social realism because of its origins and documentation. 
And by this point, photojournalism was a well-established practice. Also, in contrast to media such as painting, photography had the potential for much more vast distribution. It was a visibility that went well with the social realist aim to communicate with the masses. Margaret Burke White was a well-known photojournalist and she used her photography to challenge the modern urban experience. Now in January of 1937, because of torrential downpours, the banks of the Ohio River flooded, creating one of the greatest natural disasters in American history. The city of Louisville, Kentucky was particularly affected with over 60% of the city underwater and two thirds of the population evacuated where entire neighborhoods had disappeared. It's one of the worst natural disasters in American history. Now in this photograph, Burke White isn't, what she does is she isolates part of a flood relief line as it stood in front of a billboard. Now she made some pretty brilliant choices here. First of all, she crops the image so that the line extends past the edges of the photograph on each side, making it seem as though this you know, relief line extends on for infinity. You've got people stand grouped together densely, which makes this line seem even more uh, populated with people, a lot of people needing help. And both of these communicate the extent to which this flood affected people and which population of the city was disproportionately affected, which as you can look here and see, that would be the minority population, people who tend to be in lower socioeconomic levels. And then it's interesting enough because these people stand in front of this billboard, right? And then this is where the very clear disconnect occurs. You got this disconnect between the people, not only in terms of race, but also in terms of class with those depicted in the billboard, where we see the typical, uh, you know, stereotypical, I should say, stereotypical American family without a care in the world, you know, in their little like Volkswagen bug with their cute little dog right here in the background, right? Uh, you know, and they look nothing like the people lined up below. These people are out for like a picnic in the, uh, you know, woods somewhere. That's like what I'm imagining, right? They're out for a picnic in the woods, this time of leisure. They're all dressed nice, right? Nice hair, healthy teeth. And then here you've got people who uh, are just trying to, to eat something. And then the disconnect, of course, is also seen with the advertisements claim that this represents the world's highest standard of living when this is the actuality here. And the ironic thing was that this claim was made in 1937, which was one of the worst years of the depression. Now between 1906 and 1918, you have the photographer Lewis Hine who worked for the National Child Labor Committee to put together an assessment of the city's industrial conditions. Um, he was going around and he was, you know, taking these images inside of factories. And it wasn't like the owners of the factories were like, hey, come on in and document what we've got going on, uh, because they were up to shenanigans. And so what Hein would do is he would disguise himself as like a potential investor or like a fire inspector to gain entry. And then he would covertly photograph what he saw. And um, what he saw was horrible. And you can see that in these photographs here. Children as young as five years old working 12, 13, 14 hour days for like pennies. Children not wearing any sort of protective equipment. Um, look at this person here isn't even wearing shoes. These are children working on heavy machinery that dwarfs them in size. These conditions were dangerous and it was no surprise that many of these children were injured and even killed in these labor conditions that they shouldn't even have been in in the first place. Now, because Heinz doing this, you know, in secret, he didn't have time to carefully craft a composition. And as a result, there's an honesty to these images. There's an immediacy that lets people know that these photographs are not fiction. There are very clear details of dirty interiors, these cute little kids, these little people who are dressed in rags. They're dwarfed by the machines, as I said. They're not wearing shoes, as I said. It is really heartbreaking to look at images such as these and know that this is actually a really real part of labor history in America. 
Now, when Hein finished up, his results comprised of a six-volume report, which gives you a sense of the pervasiveness of the problem. The whole purpose of the project was to support legislation to end employers exploiting child labor. And you want to know what? It worked. It shows us that the realist and the social realists were right, that art can incite change. And this is why I get all salty when I hear people say that art history is simply a fluffy humanities class or that art history isn't relevant. Art is powerful, and people have long understood this fact. This is why art is destroyed in times of war, because the people who seek to dominate and control understand the ways in which art can represent identity and culture and the ways in which art can tap into our emotions and inspire us and compel us to come together and act. Let me ask you a question. Are you thankful that you're not forced to work over 40 hours a week? Are you thankful that you didn't work when you were five years old or that actually you can't work before you're 15? Are you thankful that there are laws in place that protect you as a renter so that you can live in a home that is safe? If you answered yes to one or all of those questions, then you can actually thank social realists. It was art that incited those social changes, changes that even today that we enjoy that ultimately protect us and preserve our social and human liberties. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now and I'm going to move us on to our second American style which is regionalism. Now, social realism and regionalism are not necessarily complete opposite approaches to art. They both were roundly distrustful of modern art, and we see that in both styles' rejection of abstraction to instead favor realism, right? Also, both were against industrialization and both wanted to create art that was for and about the everyman. So I think the difference really comes down to the regional focus. Now we know with social realism, the focus was more on the urban environment, while regionalism, the focus is more on the rural environment. Because this focus was so you know, clearly placed on agrarianism, I think fewer and fewer people were able to identify with regionalism, right? And that has caused some people to view regionalism as being a more nostalgic style, like a looking back to times past that really no longer exist or uh, exist in very limited extents, which I don't think, you know, again, is necessarily a compliment to call something nostalgic in all cases, this one particularly, because nostalgic could be considered almost like escapist, right? This willingness to pretend that this relentless march toward modern life was not happening when it was happening, right? And causing the type of issues that people like Lewis Hine and Margaret Burke White were addressing. Now, regionalism was a style that was not really practiced very widely. There's fact, there's only three artists that really are associated with regionalism, and I'm only going to focus on one of them, the most famous and probably the bossest of all regionalist painters, and uh, that would be Grant Wood, right? I mean, who hasn't seen this painting, right? Now, Grant Wood, he is from Iowa, and his paintings focused on rural scenes from Iowa, where he was born and he was raised and he lived most of his life, aside from a few years spent studying in art um, out in Europe. Now, in this painting here, life in Iowa is the focus. Now, here's a little fun fact for you guys. This house in American Gothic that you see in the background is an actual house that is located in the lovely town of Eldon, Iowa. I have actually been to it. And I lived what is seriously the art historian's dream. I didn't know this was going to happen. Not only did I get to see the house, but they let us dress up in clothes so that we could actually pretend like we were the people in American Gothic. So awesome. Definitely worth the four hours that we drove out of our way to see this place. Now, when I saw the house in person, I learned two things. Okay, This is why you should always look at art in person. First, I learned that the house is actually a lot smaller than what it looked like in the painting. And two, I learned that the house wasn't an exact replication. 
And where you can see that is in the different treatment of the curtains, right? That's the main difference here. Now, in this very famous painting, a lot of people think that what you're looking at is a depiction of a man and his wife, but actually what this is intended to be is a farmer and his daughter, who in real life, the models for these two people was Grant Wood's sister, Nan, and his dentist. Now they stand in front of their home, which has been built in a style known as Carpenter Gothic, which is where this title American Gothic comes from. Now Carpenter Gothic was an American Gothic revivalist style, right? And we know what revivalist styles are, right? Styles that look back and the, in, in the intent to revive the past. So in this case, Carpenter Gothic is looking back to the Gothic style, which was a highly religious style that began in 12th century France. So this is the late Middle Ages, the late medieval period. And the Gothic style was used primarily to build these amazing soaring cathedrals. Now what makes this Gothic, this structure, is the pointed arch window that we see here, right? Pointed arch windows, they're kind of long like this, they're called lancets, right? That's a common feature in uh, Gothic architecture. And you can see that this window has a really prominent place in the composition located right between these two people here. So clearly this is important. And then what makes it carpenter Gothic, Gothic in these sort of architectural features, carpenter coming from the use of wood rather than stone, which would be the material used to construct a Gothic cathedral. Now, the common interpretation is that the Carpenter Gothic style here is intended to suggest that religion plays an important role in the simple and honest lives of these rural Americans. That rural Americans are moral and they're ethical in their approach to their hardworking, simple lives. That these people themselves, right, that they're the symbols of strength and dignity and fortitude. That they truly are the backbone of America. We get the sense of this also with these people's traditional rural clothing, the overalls and the apron. And this, of course, is in addition to the very serious expressions on their faces. Uh, no one's joking around in this painting. Uh, and this gives the work this very severe quality that's enhanced by Wood's meticulous brushwork, right? For people living in rural Iowa, life is serious business, obviously. Now, what we can do is we can support this interpretation by some formal analysis, okay? We have all of these very like sharp angular lines and geometric shapes, which we've talked about these already with the Hopper painting. They give the composition this very severe, very strict feeling. They take away that sense of emotion. You've got a color palette that also is doing this because it's so restrained and neutral. And then a little bit of iconographical analysis. Some have accepted has suggested that this like hair that kind of comes out of her uh, hairdo is her desire to uh, break, three, break free from all this rigidity and religiosity. Now this formal analysis and the meaning that it suggests, what I've just broken down for you, this is what you'll usually read about when you are learning about this painting. But a few years ago, I read this like mind-blowing book about Grant Wood called Grant Wood, and it was by the art historian Art Trip Evans. And he suggested an interpretation that completely changed my perceptions of this piece. Um, and I'm pretty on board with what um, this guy had to say. So let me offer you another explanation to this painting, okay? Now, Let's bring in another work of art. Now, what Artrip Evans did that was so different is he didn't do what most art historians had done, which was conduct formal analysis, but he actually was working with a different methodology called biography. Now, with this methodology, the personal history, the biography of the artist is considered when trying to determine why the artist created the work of art. Now, to me, this speaks really to the power of methodology, that you could have a single work of art, that you can use two different, two different methodologies and come up with two completely different interpretations, okay? So 
Here's the story. Now you already know that Grant Wood, he grew up on a farm in rural Iowa, okay? Now he grew up in a family where it was um, three sons, and then the youngest child was the, the daughter, Grant Wood's sister, Nan, right? Now this is a farm landscape that he grew up on in a rural environment, which tends to be locations that are more culturally conservative. And the farming environment, think about it, is one that's inherently active, right? You're like getting on tractors and you're like putting hail in places and you're like roping animals and you're like slaughtering them. And I don't know, this is what I'm assuming happens on farms. I'm not like a rural expert on things, right? But if you think about it, this idea of like hard physical manual labor, uh, this idea of like moving things and like picking stuff up, this is all very masculine. So it does create this more sort of masculine conservative culture. Now within this, you've got little Grant Wood, right? And um, he's, you know, really young guy. And he's like, uh, you know, saying, oh, hey, um, I'm actually not super interested in farming. And he's little, he's like five. I'm not super interested in farming. Um, I'm more interested in being an artist. How do you think that went over? And on top of this, and this was happening kind of in the background, Grant Wood was also wrestling with questions of his sexuality, right? Which again, not something that really is gonna be well embraced during the 1930s in rural Iowa on a farm, right? Now, his mother, he had a very close relationship with because his mother encouraged him to create art. So what would happen is she set up this little like studio for Grant Wood to make his art, but in private so that it wouldn't upset his father. It was under the kitchen table. So he'd be under the kitchen table, he'd be making his art, and then his mother would be cooking in the kitchen. And he really um, you know, valued those times of, of being with his mother and being with the art that he so uh, desperately wanted to, to create even as a young child. Now, this allowed him to have this very close relationship with his mother, a close relationship that lasted his entire life. He actually lived his whole life with his mom. There was even a time when they lived together. He was an adult, adult Grant Wood and his mother in a studio apartment. How do you think that would be to live with your mom as an adult in a studio apartment? Just something to think about, right? Shows how close they were. And they lived together all up until he died. Now, let's think about then this background against this American Gothic painting, right? Approaching it from the methodology of biography. So one of the things that Grant Wood did is he created this painting, his mom, right? Woman with plants. Oh, it says plants. Should be plants. Oops, right? It's a painting right here of women with plants, right? Now, if you look at this painting of his mother, you can see that there are some similarities with what's going on here, right? Can you see them? We've got a similar hairstyle, the hair sort of swept back. We have the same sort of wistful looking off to the distance. We have the same outfit, this black dress, the same exact cameo. This cameo actually uh, Grant Wood brought back for his mother as a gift when he got back from studying in Europe. And then you have her holding these plants, right? Now, what our trip Evans suggested is that the majority of Grant Wood's work was actually autobiographical and was Grant Wood's way of working through the struggles of his identity, the struggles of growing up struggles of his childhood and that this painting here that this is actually not a painting of a you know a farmer and his daughter but this is actually Grant Wood making a sort of veiled painting of his parents now this lady here would be his mother right this painting was one of Grant Wood's favorite paintings of his mother he sold it um, and then you know never recreated it but what happened was, is after he made this painting, at this point, he was getting so famous that his mother was like, I'm not sitting for you anymore. I'm getting too well known around the community. So it was suggested that he began to use his sister Nan as a stand-in for his mother. Now you can see that she's wearing that same 
apron that she would wear in the kitchen, right? Which was probably very important symbolically to Wood because of those moments of making art in the kitchen with, with his mother. What to me is super telling though is this uh, plant she's holding. It's called mother-in-law's tongue. Grant Wood's mom loved plants. If you look here in the background, here it is, mother-in-law's tongue, right? So here are these, these similarities. Now this then would be the representation of the, the father. Does this guy look like a kind and loving father that you want to have a relationship with? I don't think so. And even this like pitchfork is like, like bars or something that like even more so like keeps this person away from you. Now the deal with the father was that um, Grant Wood, as far as at least our trip Evans was saying, Grant Wood actually never painted his father that that was something that perhaps was too painful, that he couldn't even go there, right? And that the only image that maybe included his father could be found in his painting, Dinner for Threshers. And it's one of the guys seated at the table, right? I'll bet you anything it's this guy, right? But tellingly, his back is to us, once again, unaccessible. Now, Here's the part that's sad. So Grant Wood is at the end of his life. He's dying. And um, he's in the hospital. And he calls the nurse. Come in, come in. The nurse comes in. And he says, please bring me my paints, my canvases. I'm going to paint my father. And then he dies before he can make that painting. Ugh. Now... I bring this in, this idea of an alternative interpretation, because I worry that when we stick strictly to formal analysis of um, American Gothic, that we're oversimplifying the complexity of Grant Wood's work. And even in our other understandings of other pieces like Dinner for Threshers, where we look at these pieces, and even women with plants, right, and say, oh, these are like folksy, sort of like rural people that live a simple, honest life. But what we could be looking at as actually some really sophisticated, um, you know, interrogations into one's own history, one's own psyche, one's own traumas, one's own fears, one's own struggles, right? And that that actually is something that really wasn't being done in American art, that sort of really in, interpersonal interrogation. It, to me, almost puts it sort of on a level of surrealism. And there is something almost surrealistic about this, that more naturalist approach. It makes me think of people like Rene Magritte. And so this might be one of these situations, and you know I'm really sensitive to this, of yet another person in the history of art who may not be getting the credit that he is due. We're gonna move on, reluctantly, because I love Grant Wood. Moving on to Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange, which I love this too. I love all of it. Um, this is another super famous work of art. It's, uh, you know, by the photo photojournalist Dorothea Lange. And what happened was in the 1930s, she was hired by the Federal Farm Security Administration, the FSA, um, to go along with other photographers to document the ravages of the Great Depression on American farm and family life. So again, that same regional focus on the rural that makes this a regionalist photograph rather than a social realist photograph. Now, what happened was, is when the Great Depression occurred, it was the people in rural environments that were particularly impacted. This was because during this time in middle America, they were experiencing extensive land erosion, and that's seriously going to impact your ability to successfully farm the land. Now, many historians have attributed this situation of land erosion to poor land management and the sharecropper system. And then this also was exacerbated by natural phenomenon like drought and increased wind activity. Now, in this photograph, Lang captured a woman and her two children stopping at a roadside camp. You've got two children that look away, almost like they're scared, seeking comfort and protection from their mother. And then the mother is kind of looking out off into space, perplexed and worried as she holds her newborn. 
Now, it's not like Lang just like walked up and just like saw this scene and took a photograph and, oh, here's like one of those famous photographs of all time. No, this actually uh, was one of many photographs, over a dozen that she took, all these different versions, all these different groups. And then eventually uh, she settled on publishing the image that we see here, which great decision. Um, and what makes it such a great decision is that this photograph is so emotional. This is why it's so well known. It's so heartbreaking, right? It speaks to our emotions in a way that only art can do. Now, what's the source of this emotion, right? In this image, where does the emotion primarily come from? The face, this face of this mother, right? Now, we know, I just told you, that this photograph is carefully composed, so the question is, my question to you, is what sort of choices did Lang make to make this such an emotional work of art? Pause the video, look closely at this image, and try to identify some of these artistic decisions. Now, hopefully you did that. Now, for me, what I think one of the most important choices that Lang did or made was to crop the composition so that the figures fill the entirety of the space. So instead of standing back so that there's space that frames these figures, she stands close so that they're, uh, you know, the entire composition even extending off the boundaries on either side, right? So they fill up the whole space, which does a few things. First of all, it prevents the viewer from looking at anything else in the, in the scene but these people. Are you feeling sad and uncomfortable? Too bad, keep looking. You can't look off into the background or distract yourself from the truth of what is being presented here. Second, because these figures are so close to us, we see a lot of details that speak to their poverty. They're torn and frayed clothes. Here, holes, right? We see dirty skin, and what's sad is that the baby's dirty too, right? The children look away, and this allows for the mother's face to be the compositional focus. Because remember that viewers tend to gravitate towards faces, so the fact that we can't see the children's faces makes the woman's face all the more prominent compositionally. And then it's that expression, that worry and despair that is on her face. Her face does so much to convey the struggles of poverty. We know who this woman is. Her name was Florence Owens Thompson, and she was young. She was in her early 30s. She was 33 when this photograph was taken, which is really goes to show the effects that poverty has on the body. She seems well beyond 33 years old. Now this photograph is really important because it humanized what was happening to farm families during the Great Depression. It put a face to what people were hearing was going on. It's one thing to know, oh, there's people out in the Dust Bowl who are struggling, but it's another thing to say, this is actually what it looks like. And it's children and it's families. And you know what? This was effective. The tragic and emotional nature of the photograph did much to stir public outcry which in turn compelled the government to send aid to the unemployed, unemployed migrant workers in this, these camps. So once again, with this image, we have a testament to the power of art, art creating social change.